Good morning, everybody. So cool to be uh, doing this preaching here outside. Uh, I will say I know it's warm, and uh, it's this is really testing how well this outdoor thing is going. But I'm in a group message with some youth pastor friends of mine, uh, and they're all over Southern California. Some of them are in the Imperial Valley, where it is 116 degrees with 60% humidity. And I said... That's the type of weather that makes you question if you heard God correctly uh, when he called you to the Imperial Valley. But uh, So we don't have it as bad as other people, but I, I believe that, that God is moving. I love that we as the church are adapting, right, no matter what uh, the restrictions or regulations are. We want to be safe and smart, and we are going to find a way to meet. And uh, this outdoor stuff has been really fun, and I'm super excited. It's the first time me and uh, my dad and some of the staff were talking it's the first time I think during this whole pandemic stuff that we've like been excited, right? Everything has kind of been, we've been adapting and we've been making it work, but this has been the first time we've been like, man, I think that this is gonna be cool. The church is gonna grow. I genuinely believe there are gonna be people who uh, already I see there are guests that are here uh, that are gonna be a part of this church that have never had service inside and uh, they're gonna be in for a shock. They're gonna be like, man, worship was never that long when you guys were outside. But don't worry, it's okay. Uh, it's gonna be good. But yes, I'm Elliot. If, if I haven't had the chance to, to meet you, I'm the youth pastor here at La Palma Christian Center. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, as my mom was saying, this this pandemic, this time has been kind of weird. Uh, it's been interesting because for the last five months, me and my wife Tanner have been uh, getting ready to have our first son, Sawyer. And today we are officially 16 days away. Uh, if we make it the full time, we'll see. But officially we're 16 days away from having Sawyer, which is insane. I know some of you guys are like, I can't believe that. That me, you know, you've grown up with me and now I'm having a kid. You changed my diapers apparently, even though I came here when I was five, but uh, it's all good. Um, but it's weird, becoming a, a father has like really shifted the way that I, I see the world. And before like I, I get all your opinions, I know like you're not even a dad yet, just wait, it gets worse. But that's great advice. Thank you so much, all the parents who are gonna tell me how much sleep I'm gonna lose, how, how terrible it is. That's so great. I'm so thankful for all of that advice that you uh, unsolicited give me. And uh, I'm just saying, we, we know. We know that we're in for, for a shock and it's gonna be uh, something crazy, but already it's shifted the way that I, I see the world. I can't count how many times in this last little bit of Tanner being pregnant where we've been watching a movie or uh, looking at something on social media, and I've said this phrase, that's someone's daughter. Like, I never said that before. That's not something that, like, teenage guys or young adult guys think or say, but, like, it's changed the way I see them. Like, that's someone's daughter how can you know whatever it's like it's shifted the way that I see things and, and it's really starting to to dawn on me the responsibility of being a dad right like we have to teach this kid everything you know like that that kind of really hit me the other day I was thinking about this like this kid is going to know how to talk because of us Right, you, you, we, you don't really think about that, right? Like your teachers help to expand your vocabulary and everything as you grow up, but essentially you know how to speak today because you, you watched and you learned from your parents. And I've been trying to pitch this idea to Tanner. Uh, you know, some people, they, they uh, get their kids to be bilingual, right? They, one parent speaks uh, exclusively in a different language to the, to the kid and then they just know how to speak two languages. That would be awesome but that would just mean that me and Tanner would have to know another language, which we don't. So this is my idea. I want to have Sawyer have an accent, okay? Uh, and I think we could do it. I've been thinking a lot about it. For the first two years of his life, this is all that would need to happen, okay? We exclusively watch British television, only British television. That's all that this kid watches. We exclusively speak to him in British accents, and anyone who wants to be around him has to speak in a British accent. I think if we did those things for the first two years of his life, we'd have a little boy with a British accent, which would be so cool and interesting, but Tanner's not really going for it, but uh, I think it'd be awesome. But uh, like I said, you don't really stop to think that someone taught you how to talk, and, and you it's, it just kind of happened, but I, I do remember 
growing up learning what certain words meant, right? I remember learning what the curse words meant because I'd go and ask my dad, I'd say, hey, I heard mom say this, what does that mean? And he'd be like, don't repeat that. Um, but I remember learning what those words meant, right? But I, I, I remember a few different like instances. I remember learning what the, the phrase, I doubt it meant, okay? Because what happened was, uh, we were, we were new to the church here. It was early on when, when me and my family had just come to the church, and we went over to the, the former lead pastor's house, Pastor Yarbrough. He had a pool, so we went over there to swim. And I remember us kids were in the pool swimming, and my dad was with us, and he was swimming, and my mom walked out and said, hey, Steve, we need your help to, to set the table. We're getting ready to eat. Can you get out, dry off, and get ready? Uh, and he looked at her and just kind of smiled and was like, I doubt it. And uh, she just rolled her eyes and walked back inside. And I remember looking at my dad and saying, like, hey, dad, what does what does I doubt it mean? And he kind of just smiled at me and he said, it means yes, son. And he walked in and like and helped. And that's all like that's funny. Right. And that's cute and everything, except for like a five, six year old who doesn't know what that means. I registered that as I doubt it means yes. OK, cut to two weeks later. Right. We're, we're listening to the voicemails on our house phone, and uh, Miss Joan, Miss Joan Sellers, who uh, just had a birthday yesterday, right? Anya, happy birthday, Miss Joan, if you're watching this, we love you. 90 years old, man, that's amazing. But uh, Miss Joan, she would called the house, and, and she was always like the Disney hookup. She had Disney tickets, and so she called and she said, hey, pastor, we have these extra Disney tickets. They're going to expire. Uh, we could get you and your family in tomorrow. I know it's a school day, but if you're, if you're cool with taking the kids out of school, we'll get you into Disney. It'll be awesome. And we're listening to it, and I'm like, Dad. Can we, can we miss school? Can we go to Disney? Like, is, is it cool that we do this? And he, he looked at me, he's like, ah, I doubt it. And I was like, yeah, let's go. We're going to Disney. And he was so confused. And so was I later when he really explained to me what I doubt it meant. But I remember that. I remember learning what I doubt it meant the hard way. But I, I remember learning as well uh, what saying I promised meant. I remember that being a big deal that my parents explained to me and my, my sisters that when you make a promise, it meant something. It was serious, it, it held weight. It wasn't a word you just threw around. Um, and I think that's probably why, like when my mom uh, would pinky promise me, it meant so much to me, right? Like she, she talked a couple of weeks ago uh, about how literally she would pinky promise me stuff uh, that she had no way to know. Literally, I would go to an amusement park and I'd be ready to go on the big scary ride and I would say, Mom, you pinky promise I'm not gonna die on this ride? And she pinky promised me, and that was good enough for me, right? She had no way to know that, and I think deep down I knew that there was no way that she knew that I wasn't gonna die on this ride, but she figured the odds were pretty good that I'd be all right, right? But there was something significant about when she would pinky promise me because I knew that, that a promise was not something that you break. You, you kept your word, and the, the logic went for me, if my mom promised she's not lied before, so she's not gonna start lying now. And so a promise meant a lot to me and it, it had to mean a lot to us because for our family a promise was was sort of the end all be all of keeping your word right we, we didn't swear uh, it was just kind of the way our family did things like they were like I don't want you swearing and we definitely did not swear to God okay that was something that they they instilled in us we were like taught from an early age just promise let your promise mean everything so that you don't swear to God and so I always stayed away from it but do you know uh, that in the Bible, people swore to God. And, and like there was one instance that really blew my mind that, that I don't think that you would believe me where God actually swears to God. I swear to God, I'm just, I could not resist that. I know some of you are gonna be offended, I'm sorry, but it was just, it was right there. Hebrews 6, 13 says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore, to himself, okay? So in Hebrews, he's talking about God really trying to instill how powerful his word was. And in, in our lives, right, we'll be like, man, I swear on my mom's grave. I swear on my kid's life. I, I swear to God. But God was like, there's no one greater that I could point to, to to like really double down on how much I mean what I'm saying. So I swear to myself. I swear to me. And this morning, we're, we're continuing with the series that we're in called The Promised Land, right? Where we're talking about these different promises of God. And, and already there's been some uh, amazing messages going through some different promises that God gives us. But as I was studying, 
I didn't want to really land on one specific promise. What I want to talk about this morning is really why God's promises are significant and how we can see those promises fulfilled, right? Like, why does it matter so much when God says that he promises something or when he swears to himself on something? Why does that matter to us today? And how can we actually see that practically fulfilled in our lives? And so, so that's what I want to kind of land on and, and speak to you guys about this morning. And, and I don't know if you grabbed when you came in, when you were getting your mask, uh, we started doing these little, like, note things. My lovely wife, Tanner, was, was putting one up. Uh, seriously, that's a great tool uh, just as we're outside to take notes or you could do it in your journals or like just keep it 100. You're like, I wasn't taking notes inside. Why will I start now? Whatever. That's your prerogative. But I have a couple of points for you guys in uh, today's message that I just want to kind of look into and again, really study why God's promises are significant. And so the first thing, if you're taking notes that I want to talk to you guys about this morning is the certainty of his promise, the certainty of his promise, right? These are uncertain times that we're living in, right? The, the two ways to really describe the times that we're living in are uncertain and unprecedented, right? It's never happened before, and we don't really know what's going to happen. And uh, I found myself a lot during these last five months feeling uncertain. I feel like saying uncertain uh that the times are uncertain is a very good way to describe what we're, we're living in because there's so many instances where I've just found myself not knowing what to think, not knowing what to feel, being very confused on what to believe, right? Because we live in a time where truth is so relative. This, this blows my mind, but there are so many phrases like, well, this is my truth. Like, you can speak your truth, but let me speak my truth. Like, the idea of saying my truth um, is kind of just – hypocritical it doesn't make sense because truth isn't something that is relative or subjective truth is truth right it stands but we live in a time where there are so many opinions there's information overload social media has allowed us to to hear everyone's voice at one time and and it's so easy as well we live in the the world of fake news right i'm not like this is the thing whether you are a liberal or conservative or democrat or republican you believe in fake news Whatever the news outlet that, that disagrees with your bias is fake in your eyes, in a sense, right? And, and, and I get it. And I, and I find myself, like, looking at a, an article or a video more. Let's be real. I'm not reading very many articles. But thank you for all the videos that you share. Uh, because I'll watch the video and I'll see the information and it will, you know, move me or it will uh, make me uh, upset or, or confused. And but the first thing that I think now is just like, well, I don't know if I believe this. I don't know if I can, I can, I, I don't know if I can understand. Like, we are in uncertain times, and I don't know what to believe. I don't know what to feel. It, it's so confusing and, and overwhelming at times. And, and in times like these, when I read verses like Romans 8.28, where Paul is talking to the church in Rome, and he says with such certainty, and we know, and we know, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. First of all, it doesn't really seem like that's what's happening, right? It doesn't seem like things are working together for good right now from my perspective, from my opinion. And so I see that and I'm like, well, it doesn't feel like that. And I don't know how he can say with such certainty that he knows that all things work together for good. For me, if I wrote this letter, it would be probably something like, man, I really, really hope. I, I wish that all things would work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Or maybe even something like, aren't things supposed to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose? But I don't know if I can have that, that certainty and that, that solidity to stand and say, I know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I would wager to say that there are a lot of people, or a few people at least, here today or watching that kind of feel the same way that I feel. You're, you're uncertain, you're unsure, you don't know how, what to believe, you don't know what to think, you don't know where to look. And if you're in that boat, I wanna look in Hebrews. I wanna look in Hebrews and Romans today because I feel like in that we're gonna find all that we've been trying to, to understand. And so first let's look at Hebrews 6, 13 through 20. 
starting in verse 13. I read this earlier, but it says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes and oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God, we give you all the glory and honor. We thank you for what you're going to do in this place. Move in our lives. I pray that this word would impact us past just this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So I love the way that the writer of Hebrews is describing the certainty of God's promise, right? He, he says things like God swore to himself, and he wanted to really uh, double down on how, how sure and how true his word was. But I love the image that he uses for this. Let me grab something real quick. The image that the writer of, e uh, the writer of Hebrews uses to describe the solidity of God's promises of the hope that we have in Jesus is an anchor. And Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Cox, he let me borrow the anchor from his boat. Uh, it's slipping away into the ocean as we speak. Uh, but no, he let me borrow this to kind of just see what an anchor looks like, right? I'm, I'm struggling to hold this out right now. My quarantine workouts have been very slim to none. But this thing is solid. I can tell you right now, this thing is not flimsy. It is solid. It is short. An anchor... Let me put it down. An anchor, by definition, is an agent of stability, security, and steadiness. An anchor is something that is solid. And you tether yourself to an anchor when times are unpredictable or, or when things get difficult. And no matter what the circumstances around you look like, you are stable. That is what an anchor exists for. And whether you realize it or not, spiritually speaking, we are all tethering ourselves to different things or people or habits that we are using as an anchor. Your soul, who you are, needs to be anchored to something. It's the one thing that all of us have in common, the fact that we need something greater than ourselves. And, and, and this is the thing, it's not up for debate. Even if you're here today and you're like, I don't know about all this God stuff, you are trying to anchor yourself to something. And I've seen firsthand that when you anchor yourself to the wrong thing, it can have devastating effects on your life. Think about it like this. We use substance or addiction as an anchor sometimes. And I don't, you don't have to take my word for it. There are people sitting here today who can testify that they had anchored their life to a certain substance or a certain addiction. And it might have numbed the pain for a little bit, but ultimately the results were devastating because it was never meant to be the anchor. Is there anyone here today that can just wave your hand and say, I have been set free from the chains of addiction and substances to let some of us know if you have been set just wave your hand if you have been set free from some of the addictions and substances that can hold us down right we anchor ourselves to these things and and, and i'm so excited for those of you guys who have found that that you've been set free from the bondage right of addiction and, and substance because i feel like we, we see that as like obviously not not the answer, right? Like, well, yes, I, obviously I don't want to be someone who's addicted to anything. I, I don't think that that's the answer, so I'm not going to anchor myself to that. But just as devastating, but not as obvious, we anchor ourselves to the idea of success, right? We're all about like, no way I'm going to anchor myself to any addictions or substances. That will ruin my life. But we willingly anchor ourselves to these ideas of success and we allow that to be the source of our fulfillment. We allow that to be the foundation on which we build our life. And I'm telling you, it might not be as obvious, but it will be just as devastating because it is not the anchor you're looking for. 
The anchor you're looking for, the security and steadiness and stableness that you need for your life is not in your job. It's not in promotions. It's not in the amount of money you make or car you drive or, or, or influence that you have, social media followers that you gain. None of that can produce the, the stability, the security, the sureness that you are looking for. I think a good, there, there's a lot of reasons it won't work, but, but I was reading a book that described it like this. The best reason that uh, the ideas of success can't anchor you is because we, are, we have souls, right? And so as people with souls, we cannot be anchored to things that don't. Things without souls cannot anchor those who do. Things that do not have souls cannot anchor those who do. And, and I think that that's a thing to be uh, reminded of whenever you're trying to, to, to climb that corporate ladder or find that security in, in all of these things. They're not inherently bad. And it isn't me preaching and saying, don't go after these things. But it's just saying, don't let that be your anchor. Don't let that be your foundation. And so what do we do? We say, all right, I don't want substances. I don't want addictions. I don't want to chase these ideas of success. But we anchor ourselves to relationships. And this is a tricky one, right? Because as human beings, we all share the, the commonality that we have souls, right? And so we anchor ourselves to someone else who has a soul. And this is the, the thing. It, it, it's a step in the right direction. And I would even say it works in a pinch. It might even work for a little bit. But this is the danger of anchoring yourself to another human being. You are anchoring yourself to someone who is just as broken and hurting as you are. It's as if you're drowning in the ocean and instead of, uh, of, of securing yourself to a stable buoy or life jacket, you grab onto another person. That might give you an instance of, of getting your breath, but ultimately it's because you're pushing someone else down. Right. Two drowning people are not going to be able to help each other when they're in the middle of this storm. And so what we have to remember is when you anchor yourself to another person, when it, maybe it's your husband or your wife or your children or your, your parents or, or a friend from, from that you've known your whole life, whatever that may be, that relationship is never going to produce the security that you need. And ultimately, it's ruining your relationships. Maybe some of the reason that some of your, your guys' marriages are, are so under stress is because you're putting too much pressure on that. Right? That other person was never meant to carry the weight of being your anchor. And when you put that on them, it's too much for them to carry. And ultimately, they're not going to be able to handle it. And they will let you down. It's, gonna, it's going to tear them apart. And it's going to leave you disappointed. So our anchor is not supposed to be a substance, an addiction, an idea of success, a relationship. Our anchor, obviously, right, it's Jesus. Our anchor is Jesus. It's the answer that we're looking for. I, I know the word church and it's what you expected me to say, but just because it's simple doesn't make it any less profound or life changing. The answer that you're looking for is found in a relationship with Jesus. This is the beauty of it. He, Jesus has a soul, but he has no brokenness. He is the perfect anchor. He is the perfect answer. He is everything that we want. He is everything that we need. This is the way that I say it in youth every Tuesday night. He is what you're looking for. Whether you realize you were searching or not, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is our anchor. He is the security and the hope that we need. But this is what I love about Jesus, right? Jesus being the answer and Jesus being our anchor, the hope that we have in that isn't necessarily found in what Jesus will do. Right. I think a lot of the times we're all about Jesus being the an anchor and the answer because it's like he's going to save you. He's going to rescue you. He's going to bring you out of it. And, and I believe he has the ability to do all of that. But our hope isn't in what Jesus will do. It's like we were singing about earlier. Our hope is in who Jesus is. Our hope isn't in Jesus's ability. It's in his character. He is our cornerstone. He is he is our, our way maker. He is our miracle worker. He is our promise keeper. The light in the darkness. He is the answer that we are looking for. And when we are connected to him, no matter the circumstances that go on around us, we will be secure. But here's the thing. We're all about anchoring ourselves to Jesus until we remember that an anchor is used most often in the middle of a storm. Right. And, and this is the, the crazy thing about an anchor. An anchor doesn't take you out of the storm. It keeps you steady and secure in the middle of it. 
And we have this warped view of, of, of Christianity or what God and, and Jesus is supposed to be like. And a lot of the time, I think we would rather it say that Jesus were not the anchor for our soul. We would rather say Jesus were the helicopter seal rescue team for our soul. So that when we're in the middle of a storm, the ladder comes down, the, the light shines on us, and he just takes us out of it and takes us to a better place where we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be you know, weighed down by the troubles of this world. But the truth is... Jesus will not necessarily bring you out of the storm that you're in, but he will be with you in the middle of it. And he says that it won't overtake you or overcome you, and you will be able to stand firm and secure. Jesus is the anchor for our soul, and an anchor is most necessary and most effective in a storm. And a lot of us are in storms today. Jesus, I, I love Jesus when he was here ministering on earth because he never, he never peddled this idea that Christianity was going to be easy. In fact, he said the opposite. Jesus wasn't this, this cult leader or traveling salesman who was trying to trick people into anything. He showed them, like, like it says in Hebrews, he went past the, the inner curtain. He went to the place where nobody was supposed to be and nobody was supposed to see. And he brought us there with him. And he said all the time, following me is going to be difficult. The road is narrow. It, 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 you know, he used language like pick up your cross, which is a torture device. He said, if you're going to follow me, it's as if you might as well sign your death certificate. It's going to be difficult. But difficulties do not mean that God is not with you. And so we have this certainty. We have this security. There, there is a, a, a steadiness and an assurance that his promises have that nothing else in the world has. But this is the second thing that I want to look at today is his promise in the struggle, because I feel like this is where it really gets difficult. We're all about anchoring ourselves to Jesus, and, and I think we could get behind the idea that he's the answer that we're looking for, that he's everything that we need, that there is a sureness that he produces that this world doesn't have. You know, I'm so grateful for that, because like I said, I'm living in this murky water of I don't know what to think, I don't know what to believe, I don't know who to trust, but I love that in it all, I can stand and say, but I know that Jesus is still good. I know that he is still true. I don't know if that thing you shared is true information or not. But I do know that God is in control. But here I am still in the struggle. How does his promise still good and true in the struggle? How does Romans 8.28 make sense? All things work together for good. When you look at the world around us and we're like, it doesn't really seem like that. What does his promise look like in the struggle? Here's the thing. I think a lot of us think and we see struggle as a sign that God has abandoned us. When, when things get difficult, our mindset is, where are you, God? This isn't what it was supposed to be like. When depression sets in or anxiety overwhelms us, we think, God, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I, what I, what I wanted to be a part of. Where are you, God? And we see struggle as a sign that God has left us. But I would say this. I don't think that struggle means that God left or that he isn't keeping his promise. Struggle might just be the means with which he fulfills his promise. Let me say that again. I don't think that struggle means that God has left or he isn't fulfilling his promise. Struggle just might be the means by which he fulfills his promise. And, and hear what I'm saying, not what I'm not. I'm not saying that God caused the struggle. I'm not saying that God caused the bad things to happen, but I've already known that he is certain and true, and we can stand on what he says. So when the Bible says that what the enemy meant for evil, God works for good, I'm able to say that God is a God who uses the struggle to fulfill his promises. Think about it like this. How is he supposed to fulfill the promise of healing if there isn't sickness? How is he supposed to fulfill the promise of provision if there isn't poverty? How is he supposed to fulfill his promise of comfort if there isn't loneliness, right? This is the thing. Struggle does not mean that God isn't working. We, a lot of us want victory, but we forget that victory comes through battle, and battle is tough. God is a God who uses the struggle to fulfill the promises that he made for us. Struggle doesn't mean that he's not there. It's just the way in which he's using to fulfill his promises. And so here's a few things that I think help to keep that in mind and to stay anchored to Jesus and to the promises that he has made to us. The first thing is this. We got to have perspective. We've got to have 
perspective. Romans 8.18 says it like this. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I love the way that Paul put that with the Romans. Because when you're in pain, it's hard to focus on anything except for the pain. Right? Like, like think about it like this. When you've had a stuffy nose, right, before corona, when a stuffy nose just meant you had a cold, right? Not that, like, oh, my gosh, what's happening to me, right? Like, when you had a stuffy nose, you, I think we've all had this feeling of, like, when one of your nose, you can't breathe through it, you just are like, man, I, I, can't, I can't really imagine what I would give to be able to just breathe out of my nose again. Like, like we get so melodramatic, and, and it's like, Oh man, I miss the good old days when I could breathe out of both of my noses and it was just, oh, both of my nostrils and it was just, my, I have two noses, right? Both of my nostrils and everything was, it, you know what I'm saying? Like that feeling of just like, oh my, and then, and then when one nose, one nostril, when one nostril opens up, the other one closes and you're like, oh, I wish I had the other one working it, right? Like when you're in pain, or, or let me put it in a more serious sense, as someone who has like anxiety attacks, one thing that I have to remember in the midst of an anxiety attack is that this anxiety attack will end. And if you have anxiety attacks, you know what I'm talking about because in the middle of an anxiety attack, it's, it's, it's not easy to remember that. Even though you know it's true, all you're focusing on is the fact that I, I feel like I can't breathe or, or I, I feel so overwhelmed or I, I don't think that I'm ever gonna feel normal again. And it can be so overwhelming when all you do is focus in on the pain and it's easy to focus on pain because it hurts. But what if, what if, what if we did this? What if instead, what if instead, I'm trying to see how I wrote it. Here it is. What if instead of only focusing on the pain itself, we saw our pain as a part of the process of his promise? What if we step back, right? It's like we're looking at this picture so close, we can't even really see what's going on. Perspective is about stepping back and saying, yeah, I, I know that I'm in pain right now. But like it says in the Psalms, there may be sorrow in the night, but joy comes in the morning, right? Romans goes on in, in verse 22 to say it like this. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. I love that, that Paul uses this idea of childbirth, right? Especially because where me and Tanner are at in our life. Because childbirth is something you have to have perspective for. If, if me and Tanner don't have perspective, if Tanner doesn't have perspective right now, she just has a really bad stomach ache. Without perspective, that's, that's what's going on. She's in immense pain, and her stomach hurts, and she's nauseous, and, and, and it's like and she can't breathe, and her ribs, and, and it's overwhelming at times, and she just wishes it would stop. And if we don't have perspective, that pain can be so overwhelming, it makes you want to give up. But when you look at it in the, the, the frame of mind of childbirth, you're able to say, yeah, there's pain right now. But like it said earlier in Romans, the pain and the suffering doesn't even compare to the glory that I'm about to receive. That is what the perspective of of suffering that we need to have to say, yes, I might be suffering right now and there might be pain, but the pain does not even compare to the glory that I'm going to receive. God is good. We've already covered that he is sure and steady and stable and true, and you can hold on to what he says. So the suffering doesn't mean that he's not working. It might just be the means with which he fulfills the promise. So, so stand firm and have perspective in the pain because I know childbirth can be painful. But you know what else? Childbirth is also a long process, which is why not only do we need perspective, we also need patience. Patience is a word used. Somebody could come up and play, whoever it is. Patience is a word used in both Hebrews and Romans. Hebrews 6, 15, in verse 18, it says, And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Verse 18 goes on to say, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Romans puts it like this in verse 24 and 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in, in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. 
Now, Romans gets a little confusing the way that he worded that, right? You hope for what you see, but you don't see it, then you don't hope, and then you hope, and you see, and you hope it, right? And you're like, what? Essentially, what, what he's talking about in Romans is the hope that we have for salvation, right? That when you enter into relationship with Jesus and you anchor yourself with, to Jesus, not only is that the answer you're looking for here on earth, there is a present, like, fulfillment that you have right now, but also produces this assurance of salvation, right, of paradise. My, my mom talked a couple week, weeks ago about the promise we have of paradise, of salvation, of eternity with Jesus. But, but Paul's saying in Romans, we hope for it, but we know that it's going to happen, but we don't see it yet, so we still have to hope for it, right? Uh, it, it's not a hope like the world knows. It's not this crossing our, our, our fingers and holding our breath and wishing that it happens. It's hoping, knowing that it will happen. It's it's living with hope, not, not hoping that it comes true. It's having the hope to know that I'm going to wait patiently for one day when I see my Savior because the suffering of today doesn't compare to the glory of eternity, right? And, and, and that's what Romans is talking about, of the patience for eternity. But, but Hebrews is, is using the example of Abraham. Right? If you don't know Abraham, he is like the father Abraham, one of the founding fathers of, of the faith, right? In the Old Testament, he, he was the one who left, left his home, left everything, and followed a God that he'd never seen, but he heard and he knew was true to the land that he promised him, and a God that, that swore to himself and said, I will make you a father of many nations. And this is the thing at the time that God made the promise, Abraham had already been waiting a long time. And so it would have made sense that as soon as God said that, his wife became pregnant and they started having kids and it was amazing. But no, that's not how it worked. God made the promise and Abraham still had to wait. And if you go through the story of Abraham, it's interesting. There's twists and turns. There are complications that didn't need to be there because Abraham got impatient. But ultimately, Abraham waited patiently and saw the fulfillment of God's promise. And this is my question. How many of us are missing out on seeing the fulfillment of God's promises, not because God isn't keeping his end of the deal, but because we're impatient. How many of us, when, when the times get tough, we just we just walk away? And I, I wonder, at, at what point have we been so close to seeing the fulfillment of the promise that we waited for for so long, but it just got too difficult, it got too painful, we got too impatient, and we gave up just shy of seeing the fulfillment of the promise because this is the thing. I know that these promises will come true because God is sure. God is steady. God is an anchor that we can count on. And so maybe the reason we're not seeing some of these promises fulfilled is not because God isn't true. It's because we are impatient. Let us not give up. You don't know how close you are. What the world has to offer is not the answer we've already dis you know, discussed that. Don't settle for second best. Continue doing what's good. Don't grow weary of doing what's right. You will reap a harvest. Your family will be changed. Provision will come. Healing will happen. I believe this. You just got to wait. It's true. 
we are anchored to Jesus, we will be secure. We will be stable. And I believe we will see his promises fulfilled. And we will be able to say with confidence, just like Paul did in Romans 8, 28. And I know, and we know, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's time to believe in something like that and to stand and to declare it over our lives and over our families and over our cities and over our country and over the world and say, I know, I know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I don't think it, I don't, I don't wish it, I don't just hold my breath for it, I stand secure on it and nothing will shake me, no matter the circumstances that go on, no matter what legislation is passed, no matter what anybody says, God is in control and he is the anchor for my soul. And so with every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you today, what are you anchored to? What are you anchored to really? Think about it. Not just like the Christian thing to think or feel. Like what are you anchored to? What is your security? Where is your stability found? Is it in a substance? Is it in an addiction? Is it in these ideas of success? Is it in the relationships around you? Well, if it is, that's never going to be enough. And maybe you've already found that. You've already sensed that. You already know that more than anybody else. It will not be enough. It will not measure up. Today is your opportunity to say, let me tether myself to something else because the storm is too great. The storm is beginning to overtake me. I don't see a, a hope or a light at the end of the tunnel. It's time for there to be a hope that my soul is anchored to in the midst of the circumstances and the craziness. Let me get perspective. Let me have patience. Let me be praying and let me anchor myself to Jesus. And if you're here today, and whether you, you've never done this before or maybe you've just got caught up in the motions and, and along the way you found yourself anchored to the wrong thing, if today you want to decide to anchor yourself to Jesus, to enter into the, this relationship with him, all I ask with nobody looking around is that you would just raise your hand right now. If there's anyone here today, today is your day to say, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I don't care what anyone else is doing. This is the decision that I need to make. This is where my soul needs to be anchored. I choose Jesus. Awesome. So God, we praise you. We thank you love you and, and we stand secure in your promises and in your words. We, we thank you, God, that, that you love us so much that you desire to be in relationship with us, that you came, you put on flesh, you paid the price for our sins, you redeemed and restored relationship with us. And, and, and a promise that we can stand on today is that we will enter into eternity with you, but also that you are going to use us to change the world around us here on earth. And those people who have raised their hands this morning, God, I pray that their lives would never be the same again. I pray that those things that they used to anchor themselves to would seem so, so futile, so feeble, so fleeting in comparison to the steadiness and sturdiness and stableness and security of you, Jesus. You are everything that we want. Let them sense that today. Let them feel that today. God, the, the storm may continue to rage, but let them view it in a different lens, knowing that you are good and you are in control. God, use us to change the world around us through your spirit.